today, we're not brewing. We're making mead. What is mead? Simply, mead is the OG of fermented beverages. The history of mead goes way back beyond what we have as recorded history, and people have been making mead through fairly simple processes throughout the ages. What we're going to do today is make a very basic mead, very simple mead. The reason we're making mead today is because we've got a hive out the back. This is about five kilos of honey that I took out of the hive yesterday. We've taken so far around about 17 kilos this, this season. It's only a new hive, it's a young hive that's still establishing itself, which is why we haven't had a huge crop this year. And I got them late in the season as well. I got them towards the end of spring, which didn't help things uh, because they got off to a late start. But they're a healthy hive and they're making some of the most delicious honey I've ever tasted in my life. The first batch that we got off had floral notes right through it. That was obviously the frangipani influence. There was, what else was flowering at the time? Jacarandas, bougainvilleas. There was a lot of flowering trees and, and yeah, flowers around. So that's, that was the influence on that honey. The last lot that I took about four weeks ago had a very distinct flavour as well. Um, it was more earthy and dark and smoky almost. And this is, this is different again. So this honey, I suspect, has come in the last, you know, sort of four or five weeks from all of the ghost gums and um, uh, what else is flowering at the moment? the ghost gums, the grey gums, all of those gum trees that flower late through autumn and early into winter. And we've still got dozens of trees flowering around us right now. So I'm expecting to get even more honey through the winter. And this is about, as I said, five kilos I took yesterday. Uh, we're only going to use about three kilos of it. Um, the recipe for this is pretty simple. To make mead, all you need is honey, water, and yeast. Now we're adding a few extras in here. We've got some hot tea here that's just sitting and steeping. And that's going in there just to add some tannins for some mouthfeel. And we're also putting in a handful of chopped sunbeam Australian raisins. And they're going in there for a couple of reasons. Yeast need more nutrients than they can get out of just honey to build their colony. So they might stress out a little bit and start producing some off flavours. And some of my early meads, I didn't put things, anything in there to support the yeast. And I got a lot of really bad sulphur smells coming out of the, the cupboard I was using to ferment in. So now I either use this or a little bit of yeast nutrient or, or something like that. In order to keep this as organic as possible, I'm using these raisins instead of something like yeast nutrient. Um, I could also use uh, dead yeast from fermentations that I've done in the past. Uh, what you do is you get the yeast cake off the bottom of your fermenter at the end and you boil it. And that makes sure that all the yeast are dead. And when it cools down, you can put it into your new fermentation and the new yeast colony will scavenge what they need from all, the, all of the dead yeast. So that's another way of doing it. The equipment that we need is fairly simple, not that fermenter, that's for something else. We need a jug for our water, we need something to ferment in. I prefer to ferment mead in these and the reason being is that if one of them goes a bit off, the, the mead takes a long time to make. It takes six to eight weeks on average. So if one of these goes off, I've still got hopefully one that I can continue with. Uh, we've got a set of scales and we've got some other equipment that I'll show you what it is that's sitting in the sanitizing liquid at the moment. 
everything's been sanitized, as you can see. In order not to have to use a lot of sanitizer, the way I sanitize these carboys is they each hold five liters. So with the Stellar Sand that I use, it's 1.5 mils per liter. I measure out uh, five, that's five, seven and a half mils. And I put that in here, and then I fill them up with water. You don't need to sterilize the outside, sorry, sanitize the outside of them because the outside isn't going to come, come in contact with your meat. You just need the inside of them uh, sanitized. And then what I do, once they've been sitting around for 15 minutes, is I tip some of it into, I've tipped some of it, well, one of these into this fermenter, and the rest has gone into my sanitation bucket, sanitizing bucket so that I'm not just throwing it away, I'm, I'm actually reusing it. So everything, the jug, all of my equipment, the knife that I use to cut them, the board, everything that's going to come into contact with the mead has been sanitized, just to make sure that we get rid of all of those microbes. So what's the recipe? Well, quite easily, one and a half kilos of honey goes into each of these. Then we tip some of the tea in. Oh, we put the raisins in first, then the honey, then the tea. The tea goes in there and that just helps to dissolve the honey a little bit. Then we put a little bit of the water in and we mix it up because you need to make sure that that honey is well and truly mixed. And uh, at the end, we top it up with water and we take a, a gravity reading to make sure that we know how much sugar is in here so we can gauge how much sugar or alcohol is, is in the meat at the end of the process. But that's enough talking. Let's do it. So I'm going to do each of these. God knows what comes out of editing. Uh, in order to get them in, I'm going to use a funnel. My hands have been sanitized as well, but I'll keep doing that as we go through the process just to make sure that if I touch anything that's got germies on it, that they don't end up in our mead. So just using the funnel, this is probably the most painful part of the whole process. And a sanitized chopstick to try and poke them down. This is probably the worst farm we'll be trying to do this with. Because it comes to such a narrow point at the end. So what I'm going to do is just put them in by hand. It's a bit of a pain. And why have I got a towel down tonight? I don't usually have a towel down. Well, honey and raisins are sticky. It's easier just to whip the towel into the wash and have to wipe the bench down and then deal with ants. That's about half an inch bottle. Sorry, an inch carboy. So now I'm going to turn the scale on and it zeroes itself. I will need that. Unfortunately, this is the only funnel I could find today that was of any decent size. So this is going to take us a little while. Oh, I need to zero that out because it's added the weight of the funnel. And as I tip, I'm just watching to watch the level in here, make sure it doesn't get too full and keeping an eye on the weight that's still only 200 grams. I think there's something wrong with these scales. Because I thought these jars held two kilos of honey. So one of two things can happen. Either I put too much honey in there, and we end up with a really strong brew. Oh, it doesn't matter how much, well it kind of does matter. I was
was going to do these together, I might do them one at a time so that I can take a gravity reading on the first one and see if there's enough honey being added. Now because this honey isn't processed, it's come straight from the hive, it does run a little easier than most honeys that you get. If you're using commercial honey, oh that's nice, if you're using commercial honey, you may need to sip the honey in some warm water to start with, just to loosen it up so it flows a little freer. But as you can see with this honey, it is still pouring quite nicely. Just as I thought, there is a problem with the scale. Because it was sitting on air, it wasn't getting an accurate reading. The towel was interfering with it. So I've actually got about, where's my phone? Subtract the weight. So that would have been about the same weight as that empty. Subtract the weight of the funnel. We've got just the right amount of honey, maybe a hundred grams over. That's an old trap for young players, isn't it? The other thing is this scale switching itself off too quickly. Okay, so I'm going to leave that. had to rethink things a little bit. When I recalculated, there was way too much honey in here for the yeast to deal with. If I'd pitched the yeast in here, they'd have really struggled because too much sugar uh, means that they can't, they can't get a foothold in there. Too much, too much sugar can cause osmosis pressures on the cell membranes for the yeast and can cause them to rupture. So that's no good. So what happens is the, when there's too much sugar, it's trying to suck the moisture out of the yeast. That's no good. So what I've done is I've tipped some of the honey from here into here. So we've used a lot less honey. There's still more honey in this one than there is in this one, and that's why it's important to take a gravity measurement. It's the next step is to pour our hot tea in there, and that'll just help to get the last remnants of honey out as well. What happens when you get an airlock? The funnel was stopping the air from coming back out. So the only way, once you pour hot tea in there and start to expand, the only way for that pressure to be relieved is back up through the funnel. So just watch that when you're doing it as well. Hold your funnel up to give the air somewhere to go. 
And how much tea am I using? Mm, about a cup in each one. Now as you can see, making alcohol isn't always a science. There's a bit of an art to it as well. Now we've got a good handful of raisins. We've got about a cup of tea. The honey, while well, we tried to measure it accurately, I suspect we've got about still 1.7 kilos in here, which is a little strong. It means we're going to end up with stronger mead, and it probably means we're going to end up with a sweeter mead at the end because it won't, the yeast won't get to chew through all of those sugars. So what next? I get a bun and put my thumb over the hole and shake and shake and shake and shake and do that to each of them. No, I shouldn't have done that. Sometimes you can't help yourself though. See that's still fairly viscous on the inside of the carboy there. Because it's mostly honey and a little bit of tea. So now I'm going to put some of our water in there. And this is good tank water, fresh rainwater. No chemicals, no chlorine, no fluoride. and it is filtered. I'm going to fill it up to about there, somewhere between a third and a half. And give it another shake. As well as mixing the honey through the water, we're adding oxygen into, because this is a wine, it's not a, a wort like we have in beer, Turn the must. The winemakers have their own language the same way that brewers have theirs. A water is a must, a troube is a lees, yeast is still yeast, ethanol is still ethanol. There we go. That's tiring. So now I'm going to put more water in there, and this time, whoop, and you see why I put the towel down, easier on the cleaner. So that's where I'm going to stop. Where the shoulder of the carboy starts to turn in, that's where I'll fill up to. Because I'm suspecting that this is going to be a fairly active fermentation. So I want to leave enough headroom in there so that when the Krausen builds, so the Krausen is a, a foamy lay, layer on top of the, the brew that the yeast create. When the Krausen builds, I want to have enough room in there so that it's not going to spurt up through the airlock and create an unholy mess. our next step. Easy. More shaking. More mixing. It's obviously a lot heavier now. So just make sure you've got hold of it. And make sure you've got a firm grip on that stopper. Now at this point, I'm going to start writing everything down. Because I can guarantee you, in six weeks, you're not going to remember what went in there, what your starting gravities were, or anything like that. Now all of my brewing, any of my all-grain brewing I do, I use a piece of software to record all of that, which is good, but it doesn't handle things like fresh water kits or meads. So I write it all down in this book, so 
this is just a basic mead and I've put 1.5 kg of honey and for the raisins, one cup steeped tea and I'm using Lullamand BRY97 American West Coast Ale Yeast and the reason I'm using West Coast Ale Yeast is that you cannot at the moment get mead yeast anywhere in Brisbane for love or money. I've used this yeast a lot uh, in the past in my ales and it does, it gives a fairly clean taste so I'm not sure if it's going to throw very many flavours into, um, into the mead, but we'll see. But the next thing I have to do is take a measurement on each of them to see how much sugar exactly is in there. And I do that with my hydrometer and measuring flask. So I'm going to designate this one number one. Not too bad. A little bit lower than I would like, but it means it's just going to produce a slightly lower alcohol. 1082. Now the question is, do I put more honey into this? Because I'm aiming for a gravity of 1010, sorry, 1100. So in order to boost that up a little bit, I need to put more honey in there. Now, put more honey in there, that's going to rise the level. I don't want to do that. Just yet. I'm going to take a reading. So that was number one. This is number two. I'm not going to write that down yet because I need to remeasure. Ferments down to 1.012. So that's pretty much what I'm aiming for, a 12% mead. I may make one just a little bit less alcohol in it. And I'll see how they compare. And I might just see which one turns out better on, on flavour. Now the other thing that I'm going to do with these when they're bottled, I'm then, in, well, sorry, when they go into secondary fermentation, I'm going to first do secondary fermentation in those spring cap bottles, and I'm going to add some fruit and other flavourings in with them. So I'm also going to try some Australian native flavourings in them, things like pepperberry, and see what that does. So I've got a, an opportunity there. I'll get about four. 750 ml bottles from each of these, as is my guess, maybe four and a bit, and the bit will be my taster, but I'll, I'll use them to start mixing other flavours in and see just what it's like. But I think if I've got one at 12% and one at 9%, then that gives me a few options just to play around with. 
So the final stage, I'm going to take this out and put it back in the sanitizer. The final stage, we've mixed all our ingredients, we just need to pitch our yeast. I'm just going to dunk that in the sanitizer quickly, wash my hands again, grab my scissors. It does have a tear thing along there, a notch, but scissors are more reliable. I'm going to put, this will do 20 to 30 litres, this one pack of yeast. But in order to get it kick started, I'm going to pour half, roughly half, into each of these. So I am over pitching. Is it wasteful? No, not really. It's going to be more reliable. all the bits out. So I'll just grab my bung again. This can go back in there. Remember, sanitised, sanitised. No germies. I'll grab this bung. Yes, I know on video it comes out like I'm saying bum. Just my accent. Sorry, it's my lack of accent. You're the ones with the accents. So, that's it. The last thing we have to do is put our airlock in. Make sure we've got the right amount of liquid in each airlock. So I've got two different types of airlock here. I haven't used this one before. It came, I think, with the Mangrove Jacks kit. So this is the type of airlock that I usually use all the time. It's fairly simple. Gas, as the, the yeast are consuming that sugar, they poop out alcohol and fart carbon dioxide. So the gas that's produced by them comes up and escapes out through this airlock. It makes its way past the liquid there and out. And it doesn't let anything back in. This one's slightly different. It's got a tube that sits over a tube. It's a little more complex, but nonetheless, they work. I've seen them work before. I've never actually used one of these before, but I've seen them working, and they're quite reliable. So what's going to happen to these now? I'm going to take them, and I'm going to put them in my fermentation cupboard, and I won't even look at them for four weeks. That's what experience tells me. We've already got action in this airlock. Now I don't know if it's just gases escaping solution or if those yeasts are already kicking off. That would be good if it is. So where was I? F fermentation covered, not look at them for four weeks. I'll get them out at that point. I'll, I'll take another reading and based on that reading I may need to add a little bit more sweetener if this the yeast in this one are more likely to chew through all the sugar than in this one, so it'll come out a bit drier. If I need to, I'll add a bit more honey, put them into secondary fermentation, let them sit for at least another two weeks, and then I'll start playing around. I'll, I'll bottle them at that point once they're done. I'll bottle them, and I will start to flavour them. I'll add some fruits into some, I'll add some Australian natives into others, and just see what, it, see what I get. Just have a play around with it. That's the beauty of this, is that it all depends on your taste. Not anybody else's. It doesn't matter what anybody else likes it. It's what you like. And if I happen to create something absolutely delicious, like the Mexican lager that I've been working on, like the porter that I've just created, then I'll make that again and again. And each time I'll try to improve on it, and make it even more to my liking. That's the beauty of this hobby. That's the end of, that's the end of this episode. It would be really great if you could like, comment, and subscribe to the channel, if you haven't already subscribed. That really helps us out a lot. And check us out on our socials. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And as I always say, stay tuned because there's a lot more coming out. Bubbles. That's more.
more than just gas and escape. This one's bombs too. I've never seen VR Y97 kick off that quick. 